Hey, if you have your Bibles, uh, I would like for you to turn, and uh, if you don't, whatever device you use, you can turn, and uh, come, uh, we want to get to Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. Now, uh, I'm going to deal with uh, some scripture today that you might think uh, is kind of weird to be dealing with uh, when it comes to hope, but uh, this scripture is full of hope. And uh, of course, you know, as Andrew said last week, uh, there's over 200 uh, mentions of hope. Uh, you know, we started this series on hope with Pastor Chris, and uh, why he said, you know, why we need hope is what he was preaching on. And then Pastor Andrew came and he shared with us about the true hope. And today, I'm going to share with you the hope based on the finished work, the hope based on the finished work. So as we look into the Christmas season, our focus and attention is given to the birth of Jesus Christ, amen? And that is great in itself. That is wonderful. But there is more to what is going on than just the birth of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, amen? And we're gonna see that today here in Romans chapter eight. And uh, if you would, I'd like for you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning with verse uh, 18. And it says here, uh, okay, let me find, there it is. For my, my Bible letter, I should get a, a large print Bible uh, because uh, <laughs> I'm getting to the place in my life now where I need everything large print. But anyway, uh, for I consider, he says, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subject to fertility, not willing, but because of him who subject it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. You know, you, you, you never would think that the creation that God created would be groaning with birth pains, but it is. And we'll see more about that in a moment. It says, and not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, yet hope that is seen is not hope, but because who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Then 26, in the same way the Spirit also uh, joins to help in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the reading of the Word of God. And Father, we pray as we enter into the Word of God today that you would just uh, illuminate our minds, Father. Help us to be able to take what we're uh, being taught from your Word and apply it to our life and be able to go out amongst the, the, the world that we live in today that is groaning and be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Let me share something that's real important here. You may be seated. Uh, God made the plan of salvation. I thought this was real uh, neat, uh, but God made the plan of salvation. Jesus Christ made the plan possible. And the Holy Spirit makes the plan work. I thought that was cool. God chose us. Jesus redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit of God sanctifies us. Election is the work of God. Justification is the work of Jesus. And sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. 
So what we have here is a beautiful picture of the Trinity engaged in the reality of salvation. Do you realize that when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Trinity of our salvation was working? The Holy Spirit of God. You know, it's hard for some people to believe. You know, they think this is some kind of uh, uh, science fiction uh, thing that we Christians go through. I've, I've talked to people over the years and tried to share Christ with them and, and share w with them, you know, things like we're going to study today. And they'll, they'll look at me like a deer in the headlights and they're thinking, are you real? Are you really real? I mean, does that really happen? I mean, can a, can a, can a spirit, can the Holy Spirit come and live in me? I mean, can, can God Spirit come and live in me? And, and I say, yes. But I said, now, you're not going to understand that until you give up and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There may be some here today, and you're looking at me just like that, like a deer in a headlight. You say, Pastor Jimmy, what in the world are you talking about? What are you talking about this justification? What are you talking about sanctification? What are you talking about the Spirit of God living in us? I mean, you, can God really live in us? Yes, in the form of the Spirit. He does live in us when we accept Him as our Lord and Savior. And you have to understand that. You have to accept that if you're going to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. The first groan that we see here in verse 22 is the groaning of the creation. Groaning of the creation. The word groan here means to utter a deep mourning sound expressing either pain or desire. You see, I groan as a desire. You should be groaning, if you know Christ as your Savior, as a desire, as a, what I would go ahead and say, hope. You're, you're hoping for the things to come. You know, Jesus Christ lays out in His Word. God laid out in, in His Word from the beginning of uh, Genesis all the way to Revelation. What is going to be taking place? And there's something in the future that is going to take place that you and I must understand. Because right now we're groaning. Creation is groaning. The Holy Spirit is groaning. What are they groaning for? Well, we'll see that in just a moment. So why does creation groan? It is groaning of anticipation and fulfillment. The answer to this question is Genesis 3, 17 through 19, it says, And God said to Adam, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return as dust. Oh, my goodness. Did, when, when I was reading that, did, did you just... Did you see what we are actually going through right now as we live? You know, it's hard for our finite minds to understand or even comprehend what it was supposed to be like when Adam and Eve were created. But because of sin, because of man, Bringing in sin because they did not obey God. We have to suffer. Creation is groaning. Creation is having to suffer for something that man did because they disobeyed God. So this is the reason for the groaning of creation. There will be groaning until the final realization of glory, a redeemed word, a renewed creation. We are moving from grace to glory. You see, right now we're living in grace. But one day, my friend, we are going to be living in glory. And that is what I hope for. And that should be what you are hoping for. That one day we're going to receive glory. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that awesome? Are you awake? Amen. I know it's early. 
you can say amen. You can do whatever, you can clap. Just don't leave yet. But that's going to be an awesome time. I hope you comprehend that. You know, sometimes I think people, they hear this stuff and it just goes over their head and they just go through life and just diddy bopping around. No, no, my friend. There's something going to happen in the end that's going to be so glorious, so glorious. In Isaiah 65, 17, it says, for I will create, what? A new heaven and a new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. Oh my goodness, I am looking for that. There's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth. And everything else that we've been going through is going to be in the past. And guess what? When we get to heaven, we will not remember anything that we've done down here. Oh my goodness, won't that be glory? We won't have to worry about all the the pain and the suffering and the things that we go through here on this earth because it's going to be all in the past. And we're going to be with Jesus, amen? Isn't that going to be a wonderful time? Oh my goodness, Revelation 22, 3 says, no longer will there be any curse. Any curse on what? Any curse on creation. The Jews talked about two eras, the present age and the age to come. The present age has pain, oppression, slavery, anxiety, sorrow, persecution, decay, disease. I'm sorry, my friend, but that's what we're in right now. That's where we are. This is the age that we are in right now, and the age to come will end all of this. And the Lord will establish his own perfect kingdom of peace and righteousness, and we who know him as Savior will be a part of that. Aren't you glad that you're going to be a part of that? I mean, when when you think about what you're going through here on earth, aren't you glad that you got something better to look forward to? Amen? We have got something better to look forward to, and that is glory in heaven with Jesus Christ. We have been delivered from the law of sin and death when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We have been given a new life in Jesus Christ. I hope you who are sitting here today, I hope you understand that when you prayed that prayer to ask Jesus Christ into your life, you got a new life in Jesus Christ. Now, we still have to go through some suffering. We still have to go through pain. We still have to go through anxiety. And we still have to go through persecution. But we don't go through it alone, amen? We go through it with Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but this pumps me up because I'm looking for a hope in the future one day. See, we have been delivered from all of this, and the beauty is we get to experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit as he moves us from grace to glory. It's going to be great. And when we hope for the age to come, this is hope to the fullest, to its fullest. The birth of Jesus is just the beginning to get us to the fulfillment of Isaiah 65 and verse 17, the age to come. So when we look at that little baby in the manger, that's just the beginning. That's not the end. That's just a process that Jesus Christ is going through to get us to where we can be in glory with him. What creation is Paul referring to here? Well, he's not referring to heavenly angels. I'll tell you that. They are not subject to corruption. They have no hope for anything because it can't get any better than where they're at. Amen? I'm looking forward to the day when I can be up there with the angels. Amen? Amen? I'm not going to be an angel in heaven. But I'm going to have a brand new body in heaven. Amen? And I'm going to be able to see my Jesus Christ face to face. But see, the angels don't have anything to hope for because they got it so good already. Now, he's not referring to Satan and his fallen angels, the demons. They have no desire for a sinful state or sinless state. Believers are not included in this term because they are mentioned separately. We're going to see that in a moment. 
He's not referring to unbelievers either because they are not hoping in Christ. Paul is referring to the non-rational, everything that does not have reason or understanding. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about the creation. Like animals, plants, trees, bugs, fish, grass, all animated things such as mountains, rivers, plains, and seas. The creation. He's not talking about man. He's talking about creation that he created, that he created for it to be perfect. Oh, I'm telling you, I, I wish, I wish I could know what it was supposed to be like before sin entered to the world. Amen. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm telling you, Adam and Eve had everything going for them. They had God on their side. He created them. He, he created all the creation. He gave them everything they wanted. All he asked, gee, I mean, God, God only asked one thing of man, one thing. Out of all this creation that I've created for you, there's one thing that I want you to do for me. That's all he asked. He said, took Adam over there to this tree, and he said, Adam, do not eat of this tree. And Adam probably said, okay, if that's all that's expected of me, I can handle that. I can do that. And then what happened? You know the story. If you've been a child of God long, you know the story. Satan comes along. Oh, Slewfoot. He comes along, and he whispers, and he talks to Eve. He gets her all pumped up. And then she goes over there and she partakes of the tree that God said not to eat of. And then what she do? She goes over and gives to Adam. And Adam, what does he do? He just falls apart because Eve, he, I mean, she must have been a one beautiful woman. I mean, he just fell all to pieces. And he just, oh, my love, oh, my, you know, I, I can't imagine. And then he just grabbed that apple and said, oh, I love you, darling, I love you. <clears throat> Through every one of us and total depravity oh my gosh one bite one bite ruined everything that God created ruined it and now a uh, woman when she bears child she has to bear child in pain hey ladies those of you that have children don't you wish you did not have to have pain bearing children? Amen. You probably would have had a whole lot more children if you didn't have to go through the pain. But I'm sorry you have to go through that pain. You can blame Adam and Eve for that. Amen. Creation is groaning. Verse 19. Creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. There is readiness and, and preparedness until the expected event occurs. What event? The return of Jesus Christ. I'm longing for that day. I'm hoping for that day. Creation is longing for that day. Creation is hoping for the day of Jesus Christ's return. Then there will be the revealing of the children of God. And this is what creation is eagerly waiting for so patiently. Daniel 12, 3 says, the children of God will shine like stars. Matthew 13, 43 says, we will shine like the sun. Oh my goodness. We're going to shine like stars. We're going to shine like the sun in heaven. Isn't that going to be awesome? Oh, that's going to be awesome. I mean, I'm getting hot up here. Do y'all, I feel something behind me that's hot. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. I'm just cracking the funny. I'm trying to open you up here. Laugh a little bit. All right? It's okay. You're getting too serious on me. All right? Then verse 20. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him. Who? God, who subjected it. Creation was unable to achieve a goal or purpose. Why? Because of man's sins. Already said that. Nothing exists like God intending to it. Creation. You see, it was cursed by God because of sin. Man's sin brought corruption into the entire, entire universe. And he brought in disasters and pollutions and other forms of evil. And this will never cease until God removes it and creates a new heaven and a new earth. Aren't you looking forward to that? Aren't you looking forward to that? 
I mean, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. It could happen any moment, any moment. And then verse 22, Paul says, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious freedom of God's children. In other words, when the children of God are fully restored to righteousness with the coming back of Jesus, creation will also be restored. Creation hopes to be set free. Creation right now is hoping to be set free. They're looking for the time when Jesus Christ is going to return so it can be set free. See, we cannot be restored by ourselves. God has to do it. It's not up to us. And when that time comes, uh, we will uh, be liberated from sin, from flesh, and from humanness. We will share eternally in God's glory. And it is impossible for our finite minds, as I said, to comprehend all that Jesus Christ is going to do in the future. But by the Holy Spirit of God within us, we can believe his truth and rejoice with absolute hope that our eternal life with our Father in heaven is secure. Our hope in heaven is secure, my friend. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you secured that. It's going to be a glorious time. But now, not only does the creation groan, but also Christians groan. In verse 23, and he says, and not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting, what? For the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. You and I groan. You and I groan also. Every true believer agonizes, agonizes over the fact that we are groaning because of what sin has done to us. Paul said in Romans 7, 24, what a wretched man I am who will secure me from this dying body. Paul knew something about that. In 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 4, he says, indeed, we groan while we are in this tent. We groan, you and I, we're groaning in this tent, burdened as we are, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed so that the morality may be swallowed up by life. So what are we groaning for? We're waiting for the adoption. We're groaning and hoping and waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. You see, right now, God has a temporary restraining order on this creation. God can remove it any time that he sees fit. So that's why we must be ready and anticipating that move at any moment. Listen to me, my friend. Any moment, any second, Jesus Christ can return. We don't know the time. We don't know the day, the hour. We don't, we don't know that. We're not supposed to know that. I'm glad we don't know that. You know why? Because, because we don't know that, and I'm, I thank God that he didn't tell us when he's coming, because you know why? We'd, we'd all live like hellions until uh, probably the day before Jesus returns, and then everybody be flocking to the altars wanting to be saved. You see, this way, we're hoping for something that's going to happen, and it is going to happen, and it's going to be glorious. It's going to be a great day, but listen to me, my friend. It can happen any moment, and that's what we have to understand. And I'm afraid some people don't get it. Some people, they walk the aisle, they receive Christ as their Savior, they go back out into the world, and they continue to live the old sorry, stinking life, hellish life that they lived before they came into the church. You can't live like that as a child of God. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be real bold about something. I personally believe that if you can accept Jesus Christ or say that you accept Jesus Christ in the church and then you walk out of the four walls of the church and you continue to live a hellish life, I'm going to say, you're saying, I know, Pastor Jimmy, you're judging. No, I'm going to say, I don't believe you got saved. You say, well, you're judging me. God's the only one that can judge. Yeah, God's the only one that can judge. But I'm going to tell you something. If you've accepted the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is not going to dwell in something that's living a hellish life and just continue to live that way and spit in God's eye. 
It's not going to stay there. I'm not saying you lose your salvation. I'm saying I don't believe if you're that type of person that you ever really meant to do what you were saying you were doing. You, and God knows your heart. God knows your heart. God knows if you mean business with him or not. And there's so many people living today, living the old hellish life they've always lived, but in their mind, they think that if Jesus Christ were to return this moment, they'd go to heaven. And I'm afraid that many of those people are going to be really (laughs) upset when they find out that they're really not going to receive the glory in heaven that many people are going to receive. Until we are glorified and fully liberated from sin through the redemption of our body, we will still have unredeemed bodies that make it very much possible for sin to harm us and to grieve our Lord. You see, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, don't think that sin's going to flee. Don't think that Satan's going to flee. He's going to be right there all the time. He, now, Satan may... Uh, don't, don't, I've said this before when I, was, when I preached a sermon not long ago about Satan and his demons. You know, you're not so important that Satan has to deal with you, but you're important enough that he'll send his demons to deal with you. And my friend... Those demons are always there, always trying to find a loophole, always trying to to, to get you to slip up, to find a moment to come into your life and cause you to sin so that you will grieve God. It is only the body, the mortal humanness of a believer that is yet to be redeemed. The inner person is already a completely new creation, a partaker of God's nature, and indwells in God's spirit. You see, when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, as I said earlier, the spirit of God comes in. Now, the outside body is decaying. It's corrupt. And if we're not careful, we can sin. But the Spirit of God, and I'm going to tell you something about sinning if you're a child of God. Listen, listen to me carefully. If you even have the thought about sinning or committing a sin, I'm going to tell you, if you're truly saved, listen to me, listen to me. If you're truly saved, the Holy Spirit of God that is in you will start convicting you that moment. The moment you start to have evil thoughts or to do evil things, if you are truly saved and the Holy Spirit of God living in you, listen, the Holy Spirit of God will start convicting you and make you, should make you feel like a dog. Because what you're fixing to do is to grieve God. And the Holy Spirit doesn't want to have anything to do with that. So it will convict you. And my friend, I'm a witness. I'm going to raise my hand above all of your hands. I am a witness to that. When you start having thoughts, and Satan and his demons want to put those thoughts in your mind, the Holy Spirit of God starts working and starts convicting you. And then when you start feeling that conviction, and you will, you should never sin. You should, you should back off. Whatever that, thin, that sin thought, and then you know what you need to do? is If you have that sin thought, you know what you need to do? You need to fall on your knees before an almighty God, and you ought to ask God to forgive you for having that thought. And guess what? God will forgive you. Then in verse 24, he says, Now in this hope, We were saved, yet hope that is seen is not hope, because hope, who hopes for what he sees? In other words, we are saved by faith, but we are saved in hope, because our salvation is not full yet. You see, our salvation, yeah, you have salvation, we talk about having salvation, but our salvation is not full until we get to heaven, until we get to glory. So what keeps our hope bright? It is the ministry of the Spirit of God in us. He He confirms our adoption. He testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. He holds and sees uh, and, and He secures us. 
So in this life, we cannot expect to experience the reality of our glorification, but only the hope of it because we haven't got there yet. But since the believer's hope is based on God's promise, then the completion of his salvation is more certain by far than anything he sees with his eyes. You see, Paul says in Romans 7, 24, what a wretched man I am, he says. Who will rescue me from this dying body? And the answer is Jesus. Jesus. Without the resurrection, we have no hope. Without the resurrection, we have never. If, I mean, this, this is going to sound strange to you probably, but without the resurrection, we may have never heard about Jesus. There is a journey that God takes when he comes into the world. He left heaven. He vehicled himself into the, the womb of a virgin. He was born. He lived here among us. He ministered here among us. Then he died. He went to a cruel call, cross. He was buried. He said he would come back on the third day, and guess what he did? He came back on the third day. And then he met with his disciples. And then what did he do? He ascended into heaven. It was a journey, and it all had to take place, but it started at the birth, and that's where we are today. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus, but I'm afraid too many people have made the birth of Christ commercial. You've heard this a thousand times from pastors, but you probably need to hear it one more time because somebody watching online may have never heard this before, but we need to stop commercializing Jesus. Christmas ought to be about Jesus. Now, I'm destroying everything you know about Christ. I mean, about Christmas. Uh, children, I've just ruined your life because you think, oh, I'm not supposed to get presents. No, get all the presents you want, but don't leave Christ out. And I'm afraid that's what's happening. We've commercialized Christmas to the point that Jesus is just a, a little baby in a manger, and that's all he is. No! Do you know that little child was born so that you and I could have glory one day and we could be with him in heaven and we could see him face to face? Oh, my goodness. Woo! That's going to be a great time, my friend. Ooh, you better be careful. I'll run the aisle here in a moment. But if we want to get an idea of what it is going to be like, just read the post-resurrection of Jesus. What do we find him doing? In Luke's gospel, we find him lighting fires, we find him cooking breakfast, and we find him eating fish. That's his post-resurrection. That's the way it's going to be with us. But we'll be in a new body. Jesus, his, his resurrection was proving to us what it's going to be like. He went out there and he met his boys and he got out there on the thing and he, he built a fire and he started cooking and they had some fish and then he went and he met them in a room and had some bread and then what did he do? The walls of the doors could not keep him back. He did something that was very strange, kind of like a science fiction thing. He just disappeared. The walls and the doors could not hold him back. He just left. He ascended back into heaven where he's supposed to be. But he left his disciples instruction on what they were supposed to do. And that's where we are today. Right now, we are waiting patiently for what we do not have yet. What we do want is glory. And we have the hope in Christ that we can have that glory. Now, I don't have a lot of time now to get into it, but not only does creation groan and does Christians groans, but also the Holy Spirit groans. And we see this in verse 26, where the Spirit does not simply provide our security, but uh, is Himself our security. Therefore, the Spirit intercedes on behalf in a way, Paul says, that is totally beyond human comprehension. And it is. It's hard to comprehend what I'm talking about today. It is. It's, it, it sounds crazy, but it's not. It's reality. And with groaning, the Holy Spirit has, has deep words for us. The Holy Spirit unites with us in our desire to be freed from our corrupted earthly bodies and to be with God. You see, the Holy Spirit lives in us, right? 
Well, the Holy Spirit would like to go back to be with his Father. But the Holy Spirit lives in us. So the Holy Spirit is also groaning for the time when Jesus Christ is going to return. And at that moment, we're all going to be caught up. Those that know Christ is our Savior, they crawled up in the air. And those who have died, they're going to rise from the grave and be caught up in the air with Christ. Oh, woo! That's going to be a great time, my friend. It's going to be a great time. And so I hope today, and I use that word because that is our series, but I hope today that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you don't, and if you're watching online, you don't, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Yeah, this is the Christmas season. Yeah, Jesus Christ was born. Why? For you. So you can have glory one day in heaven and see him face to face and spend eternity with him. So I'm going to give you that opportunity right now to be able to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you've never received Christ as your Savior, those who are watching online, I want you to be serious as a heart attack right now. And I want you to think about what is going to be said. I'm going to say a prayer. You repeat this prayer after me. And if you want to receive Christ as your Savior, you can today. You can be set free today. And you can have the knowledge to know that one day you're going to spend eternity with Jesus. And this is the prayer you need to pray. And dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that if I don't receive you now that I'm going to split hell right open. So dear Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, you forgive me of my sins, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. Lord, I want to follow you. I want to, to take the, the birth that we're celebrating uh, right now, the birth of Christmas. Father, we, I want to, to, to know what, the, what it really means to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus for saving my soul. No one looking around, if you prayed that prayer this morning and you uh, are serious without, you know, I don't want the devil to get in and mix up your mind, but if you're serious, I want you to raise your hand. Those of you who are watching online, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I'm going to tell you, those who are watching online right now, there's a number on the screen that you can, uh, at ALBC, 84576. If you would text that, say, hey, Pastor Jimmy, I just prayed that prayer with you to receive Christ as my Savior. Hey, go on there, go online, ALBC 84576, and say, hey, this is what I've done, and we'd like to know that. You know why? Because we want to pray with you. Also, we want to uh, let you know what your next step is. And by the way, that next step would be baptism and joining the church. Amen? So, just want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for watching online. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would go with us now. Lead us and guide us until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.